Well, that back there does it. No, I can tell it doesn't. Uh, my name is Jerry, and I am an alcoholic. This is overwhelming. This really is. You, uh, it, it, I, I'll talk about alcoholism, I'm sure, someplace and share in my experience, but if I could convey to you what you all are giving to us uh, at this very moment, it, it would take all the time that I have allotted just to share how deeply you touch us. Uh, you guys are absolutely marvelous, absolutely marvelous, and I want you to know that. I really do. Uh, you bet, you bet. Give yourselves some applause. Uh, I mean, to put this thing together like this, uh, I was trying to tell a, 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 a non-alcoholic here the other day what it's like to get to go do this, and... Uh, it's, it's difficult to describe the marvelous, marvelous way you all treat us and the way you greet us. And uh, this morning I, I was sitting over in Brooklyn and uh, just sitting out on somebody's stoop. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, I was, and I was watching the show. <laughs> I mean, that's a treat. I'm, I'm just a rube from Kansas, and so, I mean, this really was. Uh, that was great. Uh, I have had just a marvelous time with Sam and Paul from London, and, uh, I mean, uh, this is great. Uh, Gary and Linda know how I feel about them, and and uh, I ran into them in the hotel this afternoon, and, and uh, Gary's wife, Julie, and I tell you what, there is such a connection with you folks, and, and uh, it's just hard to describe it. I want to do one little thing, and I don't want to get maudlin about this, because I talked to Don a couple of days ago, and he is doing swell, doing well, doing real good. Uh, as, we, as we're here together... Uh, just remember him, because he really would love to have been here, wouldn't he, Gary? Yeah, uh, he. Uh, I, you know, there's a part of me just wants to, and I'm going to try to do it anyway. Part of me just wants to have a grand time with you while I'm talking to you. Uh, I mean, you, you're so good. I, 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 I cannot describe to you how good you guys are and how much you mean to us. Ah. Uh, but I have a little bit of a job to do. Uh, part of that job is to talk about what it's like to be an alcoholic. Uh, because we have so much fun in what we do, we forget sometimes that there are many, many, many people who die from the disease of alcoholism. And so we're in here having a great time, and we have to remember that this is a very, very, underneath all of that, there is a very serious issue of the fact that what we suffer from is a fatal malady. And so when you think about the whole premise of Alcoholics Anonymous starts in that first forward of the first edition where it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are over 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show others precisely how we recovered is what we're all about. And that is what we're all about. Uh, you know, the first time I heard somebody quote that, recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, they went on to explain uh, what hopeless mind and body was. And, and what that is, is it's, uh, and some of you have heard me say this, and I stole it from him. He said it's a, uh, <laughs> we do, do do that a lot, don't we? <laughs> I have a mind that doesn't work right and a body that won't die. <laughs> and that is a, hor 
That's a horrible combination. You know, a mind that doesn't work right and a body that wasn't di- won't die. And see, I'm the kind of an alcoholic as I as I've uncovered my own truth. I'm really clear about something. I've had a mind that didn't work right as far back as I can remember. Um, some of the old giants in our fellowship talk about many of us have almost died, almost killed ourselves trying to be good, uh, trying to do the right thing. And and see, if, if I were to share my total experience, and I had a lot of time, by the way, the reason they put me up first was they thought I could probably, I talked so fast that they figured I could get... <laughs> I could get everything talked about in about two hours, and then I'd give Linda ten minutes and Gary ten minutes, and we'd all go home. <laughs> that work? <laughs> so, uh, no, they were afraid. Of, they wanted to get me up first because people go to sleep when I talk. And, and uh, so i got to get mine out of the way while you're still halfway fresh. Um, but if, if, if I were to sit here and talk to you what I would really describe about from the time as far back as I can remember, I have done my very level best to do what I thought was right. I, I really, truly worked hard to be a good little kid. And I'm the kind of a, 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 a kid that can check out a library book. And some of you have heard me tell these stories, but I, I haven't got anything that works any better. I, I can check out a library book, and it's due two weeks from Monday, and I think I'm going to get it in, and I'm ready to go. And on Sunday, I get that book ready to go, and, I, and I'm going to turn it in like because it's due. And somehow it ends up being Tuesday, and I'm still a hold of the book. Yeah. Wow. yeah. By now, I'm feeling so bad, I'm trying to figure out what can I tell the librarian that, you know... <laughs> And as I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to tell them, it turns into Wednesday. Uh. And then there's 10 cents a day, do uh, you know, a, fi- a fine for being late, and I don't have it, so I'll, then it's Thursday. I mean, you can see where I'm going with this. And my whole life is summed up in just that right there. I- I'm going to do the right thing, and somehow the r- I can't do the right thing. And then catastrophe. I'm just going to have a drink. <laughs> One of the first ways that I knew I was really an alcoholic, here, by the way, I'm, I'm talking about being a real alcoholic. Do we have any real alcoholics in the room? One of the joys of Alcoholics Anonymous is that the longer you stay here, the more opportunity you have to discover whether or not you're a real alcoholic. I know today that I'm more of a real alcoholic than I did two years ago. The, The depths of my illness are more clear to me today than they were three or four years ago. My powerlessness is more clear to me today than it ever has been. I'm the kind of an alcoholic that, and I won't go back and start, Does has anybody ever had to have a drink in the middle of the night? <laughs> anybody ever have a spouse say at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're trying to be quiet, say, what are you doing? <laughs> And you're doing your level best to screw that lid off and be quiet. <laughs> and at 3 o'clock in the morning, that vodka sloshing around in that bottle sounds pretty loud, doesn't it? And no matter how hard you try, I mean, that's a hard way to live. That's a hard way to live. But I don't know about you all, but I had to do that. I had to do that. There's not a day goes by anymore. Really true. This is true fact. There's not a day goes by that I am not grateful in the extreme because I get to wake up and my mind and my body are not screaming for relief. See, that's, that's the kind of an alcoholic. I finally got to that point. My insanity was so 
invasive. And the need for some kind of solution was so overwhelming that when I would wake up in the morning, I really needed some form of relief right away. And it manifested itself, obviously, in, 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 in drinking. But I, 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 just, I, just, I just absolutely had to have a drink. So, many years ago, and some of you have heard me talk about some of my, the more humorous elements of, of being an alcoholic was long before I knew I was an alcoholic, I had the alcoholic mind and I had people meeting and uh, like aunts and uncles and school principals and, and what have you, and they were having these meetings uh, and, and the topic of the meeting was, what are we going to do with this boy? Uh, you know, and, and I talk about that, and I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. But that's, uh, you know, my whole life I've been just slightly out of step. And so when I took my very first drink of alcohol, how many of you remember your first drink? I bet you I would only have about 2% of those hands in the air if I ask you about the first time you had sex. <laughs> we remember when we had our first drink. I can remember that better than I can the first time I had sex. The sex is damn important. <laughs> of course, we got, we got Studley over here. He says, I remember both. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, really. <laughs> anyway, uh, and 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 so I've always been, you know, knowing that there's something wrong with it. First time I had a drink, I can remember that grand experience, and the grand experience was, <sighs> God damn, everything is all right. I am okay. I mean, I really was. I, I took a drink, and I can remember as that booze traveled down, and it went right straight to the place where fear is. And all of a sudden, the fear began to slowly but surely go away. And I, I remember so clearly I could carry on a conversation with some friends that were there with me, and I was no longer that little old weird, uh, weaselly little Jerry. I, I was kind of okay. I mean, it, and it was just, it was just the most marvelous experience. I was okay. And from that point on, from that point on, that's all I ever was seeking to find again was I, I simply wanted to be okay. And one of the reasons that I had so much trouble in trying to get sober was people would say to me, Jerry, if I were drinking, they'd say, Jerry, that stuff's causing you some big problems. And I'd look at them, I mean, that's not causing me a problem. I mean, i got a lot of problems, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> that's a solution for me. Alcohol is a solution for me. So when you're sitting there and you're trying to tell me, Jerry, you got a problem with this stuff called booze, we're not even on the same wavelength. Because that's not my problem. That is a solution. We sit in here in this room tonight, and I don't know how many of us there are, quite a number <laughs> but it gives me a lot of joy to know that I can say to you that bourbon is a great solution and not a problem and there's a lot of people in here who understand if I say that Jack Daniels traveled right down to that spot where the fear resided I got people who understand and it went away didn't it and people would say to me, Jerry, what in the hell is wrong with you? And, of course, I'd try to explain what I thought was wrong with me. And uh, we were talking this afternoon. <laughs> one, of the, one of the great joys, a little aside, one of, the, one of the fun aspects of one of these conferences, and some of you who have been around for a while already know this, if you're fairly new, I'll tell you what's happening. Once you get head out for a weekend like this, you're in a continuous meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You, you, you get in your car and you drive over here and you're with some alcoholics and you started the meeting. That's all that's going on. And so from now until you go home on Sunday afternoon, 
you'll be in a meeting. And there is some magical thing that happens when at least two or more alcoholics get together, isn't there? And I don't know, I mean, there's probably a hundred definitions of what's occurring, but Sam and Paul and I and uh, and that guy by the name of Larry we're talking about this morning, one of the things that happens is for the moment that we're together, everything is okay. Tonight, sitting here, aren't we all okay? I, I can sit here right now, and I, I, I don't even know what else exists out there. I'm not worried about it. That's not on my mind. I'm sitting here with the dearest people in the world, and I'm fine, and they're fine, and I know it. And I, when I'm with you all, I'm always in the here, and I'm always now. And, you know, we, we say some of those little expressions, uh, and sometimes I know I'm guilty of, of, of forgetting, wait a minute, there was a time when I couldn't be here. I might be here, but I wasn't here. And I certainly wasn't in the now. I was in last week or when I told her that I would be there and I wasn't there. And, and I'll, or I told this guy that the check was in the mail and I hadn't even written it yet. See, I can tell a little deal like that, and some of you chuckle, and I know you've been there. You know, on the phone talking to him. Yeah, I, I sent that yesterday. You haven't got it? <laughs> Jesus. God damn mail system. <laughs> Carrie, I think we're in a room of real alcoholics. <laughs> so you all are getting the picture. I'm a, I'm a graduate of a number of fine places that tried to figure out what was wrong with me. <laughs> some of them were pretty exotic and they were very comfortable and some looked a lot like a jail cell. <laughs> I think they looked like a jail cell because that's what they were. Uh, one of my favorite questions is, did any of you ever get up in the morning and, and say, you know, I want to make my mother proud of me today. What I think I'll do is I'll behave in a way that causes uh, a black and white patrol car with colored lights on the top to pick me up, put handcuffs on me, and throw me in the back seat. That's what I think I'll do today and make my mother proud of me. I have had that experience on a number of occasions, and, it, and, and, and I never planned on doing that. Anybody ever have a DUI? <laughs> Jesus, this is a quiet bunch. No, <laughs> I've had a DUI on more than one occasion. One of them I got at the uh, Strategic Air Command uh, <laughs> up in Nebraska. Oh, uh, uh, B-52 base. Oh, it's kind of a fun experience. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> they call out, they call out a lot of horsepower when you wander onto the base and <laughs> your eyes are glazed over and you, and I, and you just tell them I'm lost. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh. So, you get the idea that, and, and people would say, Jerry, what in the hell is wrong with you? And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, I would try to give some explanation. And I, and I, and I really, I really meant when I, when I would try to tell people what I thought was wrong, I, I really meant what I was telling them. Uh, but, but I just, uh, truth of matters, I just thought I was, I just thought I was bad. In the final analysis, I thought I was bad. And if I cut through all of that happened to me in all these treatment places and these fine places, uh, they finally one time decided they were just going to lock me up in, a, in an insane asylum. And uh, an old alcoholic saw what they were about ready to do to me, and he said, do you mind if I give you my, my uh, opinion as to what's wrong with this young man? I was 35 years old. 
And uh, he said, I don't think you're dealing with a crazy man. I know he looks that way, but I think he's just a simple alcoholic. And so they said, well, we'll give you a chance. And, and uh, so they sent me off to one more, one more deal uh, for treatment. And in that treatment, somebody suggested uh, that I might want to try prayer. Uh, and the reason that came about, and I don't want to get off into that story tonight, it takes too long to tell, but the bottom line is I, I thought the easiest way to get through treatment was to drink my way through. <laughs> and uh, in order to drink your way through treatments, you have to go out and smuggle it in, you understand. But to, if, a, if an alky's an alky, he's going to get it one way or the other. I mean, uh, 24 hours a day, your mind's on drinking. And and there's, their days are more like about 12 or 13 hours are going to watch you, and then they quit watching you. And when they quit watching you, you do what you need to do, which is get a drink. So anyway, uh, I was in this treatment place uh, real quick. They were going to just have to kick me out and, and uh, send me over to the nut house. And uh, so they were getting ready to transport me over there, and they said, Jerry, uh, you wait for us down in the chapel. We'll come and get you when it's time to take you over. And they sent me to the chapel, and they asked me, I said, what am I going to do in a chapel, for God's sake? And they said, well, you better try to pray. And and uh, so I'm sitting in that chapel, and I still remember as clearly as though it were yesterday. By the way, if you if you really are at all interested, and it's not very important in the overall scheme of things, except to show that this spiritual recovery program is effective. My sobriety date is January 17th, 1977. And this day in the chapel was January the 16th, 1977, and they told me to pray, and I said, and I'm sitting in that little chapel, and I'm thinking, pray to what? Uh, the God that I knew at that time was not going to listen to a little Weasley guy like me. And I was as low in all respects as you can possibly be. I was dishonest about everything. I would steal anything that I needed to steal in order to live the way I had to live. Uh, and it just, I, I won't bore you, but from a moral standpoint, I was as low as you could get. So a guy like me can't pray. And so I'm sitting in that little chapel, and, and, and I'm, just, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. And I... I, I I was trying to figure out how to pray and what to pray for and who to pray to. And it finally dawned on me, there is nobody I can pray to. There's nothing I can pray to and there's nothing I can ask for. So my prayer was something crudely along these lines. If there is a God, I'm done. I'm tired. I, I really am. I just give up. I don't care anymore what happens to me. If they want to lock me up in the nut house for the rest of my life, that's fine. I'm tired. I can't do what is required to do to stay sober. And by that time, I had, I had just literally beat myself to death in trying to do what I thought you guys were doing. I, I, I really did. And, and, and I, I don't know any way to, to bring people to that when you're doing 12-step work. I don't know any way to bring people to that point of a surrender because that's what that was. What I just described to you was a real, real, real crude form of surrender. And I had recognized that I was truly powerless. And that's what I talk about when I wake up in the morning these days. I remember now so very clearly how terribly powerless I was because I had, I had analyzed myself. That's an extreme uh, uh, statement, and I analyzed myself. But I thought I had, I, I'm a, and I'm a self-help book expert. Uh, Jesus, I mean, just think about that. Self-help. Uh, <laughs> Don't you just love to wander through the self-help section of the bookstore? <laughs> Jesus, God, it just... <laughs> it's a, oh, it's a great joke. Anyway. <laughs> so I surrender that night. I come stumbling to into AA. I don't know anything about anybody. I don't know anything about what it is you do. All I can understand in my initial contact is that you guys must not have had a serious problem as I did. You remember when you first got here and you look around and everybody looks like they're doing great? And they're all their faces are aglow and they're having fun and their eyes are sparkling and God dang, they're just doing fine. And you're just sitting there trying to figure out, I hope they don't ask me to talk. <laughs> I sat in AA meetings in a little old town in, in, in Kansas, and, 
and uh, we had to sit around the table, and everybody go down, and they'd talk. And, and, and every week, they'd, you know, they'd come to me, and I had to talk. And I didn't want to talk. Oh, God knows I didn't want to talk. And I'd gone to these meetings for about four or five weeks, and it came around to a lady just ahead of me, and she said, I think I'll pass tonight. And I thought, pass? <laughs> Nobody told me I could pass. <laughs> you people lie. <laughs> so I passed. <laughs> Oh, that's a great way to get through this deal. Just pass. <laughs> but I was hanging around with alcoholics. I had an old man who came by every day. I didn't know then that he was he needed somebody to twelve step, and there weren't many drunks to twelve step in this little town in Kansas where I was. And and old Warren had come by and picked me up. We go drink coffee. And I can't I, I can't tell you uh why I stayed sober except there was two old drunks hooking up with one another, and the magic occurs. The magic occurs. And and so I got in here, and I began slowly but surely uh, getting some health back. And then I, then about five years of sobriety, I began to make money. There's uh, two bad situations for an alcoholic. One is not having any money, and the other one is having money. <laughs> and then I began to think, God damn, I'm good. <laughs> And it went downhill from there. <laughs> no, I had about five or six real good years of, of money, if you want to look at it and measure it in those terms. And then all of a sudden, I was 12 and 13 years sober. Many of you have heard my story. And and, uh, and I want to wrap it up because I'm not going to go through it tonight. I, but I want to wrap it up. I just want to say a couple of things. I, I ran into some guys like, like Gary and Linda. Uh, and they were just marvelous. And I could tell when I could hear them talk that they were okay. Can't you spot an a, a Aki who's comfortable? Chuck C. used to say, comfortably, peacefully, and joyously within ourselves. And if I can live that way, then I can hear you when you come to talk to me. See, if I'm peaceful, comfortable, and joyous within myself, when you call me with your situation, I can hear you. Better yet, I can hear my kids. When my kids call... And I'm okay with Jerry and, and I don't need anything. Now I can hear them clearly. When my wife needs something and I am, I am peaceful, comfortable, and joyous within myself, I can hear what she needs. I can really hear. And that's, that's one of the things that these people had. And so I, uh, I'm about 13 years sober at that time and my work in the steps was looking up on the wall and, and, uh, kind of, yeah, yep. <laughs> and I'd check them off. And bada boom, bada bing, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, and I'm so sick. <laughs> and I'm on a 32nd floor of a hotel room, and I'm thinking, I think I'll just jump out the window. That's 13 years sober, folks. And it looked bad. And, and then I'm starting to run into folks like this. And I began to have a hunch that that they're doing something, and and so I ask them what they do, and they tell me, and they do what we do here. They live a life based on spiritual principles, and that sounds like a cliche. And I don't want to talk in cliches, because I, what I'm trying to convey to you tonight, if nothing else, is I am really, really, a small town drunk. And somebody in this city went out to Cleveland and met another drunk, and they put together a thing that called our program of recovery. And people like you have kept that alive and intact with integrity until a guy like me comes along in 1989 and needs something like this because it is truly a matter of life and death, and it's no longer about drinking. See, that's what this thing is all for, this, this, this spiritual recovery is about for me. It's about, I, I don't have the option to drink. That was taken away. Now I need something else. So you guys are doing something, and I can look at you, and I can tell you're okay. You're okay. So I get started into this process, and I'm just about to finish up here, and I'll tell you what happened. 
I'm into this process. Any of you ever have a tough time writing your first fourth step? I'm struggling with mine. And I got old hard heads like Brown over here. And they cut you no slack. And so I'm thinking, you know, there's got to be an easier way to do this. <laughs> so I go over to the biggest bookstore in, uh, in Denver. The Tattered Cover. Anybody ever may go to Denver, you got to go to the Tattered Cover and go to the self-help section. <laughs> I mean, just read, read the titles alone and you'll get well. So I'm reading some of this stuff, and I, and I go bouncing back over to my sponsor's house, and I say, listen, I'm trying to get this thing written, and I'm going to a lot of meetings, and there's a lot of folks who don't have to do this. <laughs> what I'm really saying is, why are you making me do this? Now, you understand that he's not making me do anything. I ask him if he would sponsor me, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, these people up here are following me real close. I asked him to sponsor me, and all of a sudden I'm saying, well, why are you making me do this? <laughs> Aren't we a whiny little bunch? Why are you making me do this? Other folks don't have to do this. And he, he looked at me and he said, Jerry, do you want what those folks have? And I said, well, no. <laughs> he said, well, let's not worry about what they do. I love you all so much. I really, truly do. I hope some of what I have discovered and the joy that flows from God through me to you is apparent enough that at some point this weekend you'll say, Jerry... What is it you do? And when you do, I may just be dead tired. And all of a sudden, I'll come to life. And, I, and you won't be able to shut me up. When you fall off your chairs from just so tired you need to go to bed, I'll get the hint that I've talked long enough to you. <laughs> the most marvelous experience of your entire life if you're new here, if those of you who are many or I know what I'm telling you, it's like preaching to the choir. But if you're new, this is without question the most marvelous experience in the world to live with and by the Spirit at all times. At all times. I don't care what the catastrophe is. And if you want to hear about catastrophes, I can tell you some. Don is fine. You're fine. We're all fine. Uh, and if I say I love you, that's not just a speaker going through a cliche. Some of you know me here. And you know if I say I love you, I really truly do. You guys are great. Thank you.